thank you for joining us today. And let me first introduce you, introduce you our group. So Tunis Our User Group is uh, the Tunisian chapter of the Global Our User Group. Uh, we aim to uh, provide a friendly support network for our enthusiasts in Tunisia and worldwide. So our goal is also to break down barriers to education and opportunity through our free online workshop, especially for scientists from medium and uh, low income countries. This group was founded by three great ladies in love with our programming. Mona Belaid, a business intelligence consultant, uh, Amal Kili, data science and engineering, and Hedia Nani, a bioinformatician and data science. I joined this great team this year, and this is my, uh, my third workshop as a co-organizer. Co uh, so today, alongside Hedia, we will uh, be uh, your host. So please don't hesitate to uh, reach uh, out to us for any issue, question during the workshop by sending a message in the discussion panel. So our uh, code of uh, conduct, uh, we are really dedicated to provide a respectful, harassment-free community every, every, for everyone. So please let's keep this place a welcoming and friendly commitment for everyone. And we really don't tolerate harassment or bullying for any community member in any form. We encourage you to visit our YouTube channel to explore our previous meetup. So uh, the recording of today's workshop will be also available soon. So for your reference and for those who couldn't join us today. Today, we have the pleasure to have uh, with us Professor Emerson Del Ponte to share with us his expertise on R for plant disease epidemiology. Professor Emerson is a professor at the Federal University of Escosa, Brazil. He teaches plant pathology, epidemiology, and data science. He strongly advocates for a reproducible research model, uh, culture, and may ultimately contribute to more accessible, transparent, and reliable science. This commitment led to him to co-found the Open Plant Pathology Initiative along Adam Sparks. I had the privilege to meet Professor Emerson during the International Congress of Plant Pathology in France last August, so where we discussed about organizing this workshop. And thank you again, Professor Emerson, for accepting our invitation. So before we start, we would uh, like to thank our partner sponsor, Absilon, for making this meetup possible by spons uh, sponsoring our Zoom. And we are really happy to have them as collaborator. So we invite you to visit Absilon blog and YouTube channel to learn about Chinese data show, dashboard, dashboard uh, data science, machine learning. They have very interesting teaching materials. So we highly recommend you to take a look. So thank you, everyone, for uh, uh, joining us today, and uh, the screen is yours, Professor Emerson. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here, uh, sharing some of my knowledge about uh, the use of uh, R for plant disease epidemiology. It was a privilege to have met you in France, and we discussed a little bit about uh, what to approach here in this workshop. Let me, I think you need to stop sharing your screen yes. so I can start sharing mine. Okay. So this workshop is about, it's a two hour workshop, right? It's yes. a quite short workshop, not a long one. So I have this challenge of presenting uh, the work I've been doing in epidemiology, try to epidemiology. So some analysis that we need to run in epidemiology, quantitative epidemiology, the idea is to translate code from other languages. For example, in our field was common to see SAS codes and uh, not much in R. So this idea, I brought this idea of developing an, a book so people can learn how to use R applied to plant disease epidemiology. You can find the book in r for pdnet It's a free, it's online, it's free. You can download actually a doc sheets, docx version for Word document, and also an EPUB version if you want to print your this this book. It's you can print it for free, so you don't need to worry about spending money buying books. Let me uh, start talking about. Uh, this is epidemiology, so that's the cover of the book. You can easily navigate through the book. And I'm gonna showcase some examples 
from this book, from different sections of this book. And the book, of course, is made with R. I use an R Studio and Quarto document system, documentation system to produce the book. So everything is on GitHub. You can look at the source code if you want. You can you can actually contribute to this book if you want. And so we can download or you can make a commit. You find some typos, some errors, you can contribute. You are open to, to this kind of cont contribution, actually. Okay, and this is the book. Let me go back to the slide. So what you can see now, it's my screen, the slides, or I think I'm something wrong. Oops, sorry. Screen. Share screen. Okay. Do you see my screen? Two photos of plant diseases? Yes. Okay. So what is a plant disease epidemic? An epidemic is a disease in a plant that occurs in the field, in a population in the field. That's the definition of epidemic. So you can see on the on the left, you can see in a, a field attacked by a pathogen, a fungal pathogen, and you can see the damage. It's pretty clear that the disease attacks and uh, causes a damage on the plants. So both figures on the left and on the right, you can see the attack of pathogens causing a disease in the population. So the definition of epidemic is that we it's the development development of the disease in the population at the population level. That's the definition, the change in disease intensity in a plant host population over time and space. So we have the triangle, we add the time, we have this phenomenon occurring at the time and the space at the same time. So that's the definition of epidemics. And why to study plants is epidemics? Because epidemics cause damage. In this plot, we can see that um, the higher the disease intensity level, the higher the disease, the lower the yield by a plant, produced by a plant. That's because the symptoms will cause malfunctioning of the system and the physiology is affected and the plant is not going to produce the same as a healthy plant. So a diseased plant, is damaged, and that's the kind of uh, graph damage curve that we usually have in epidemiology to show the damage caused by plant disease epidemics. The important point here is that we need a measure, we need to measure the disease in order to make this plot. So it's a graph, the damage curve graph that we need the yield from the plant, and we need a measure of this intensity. And that's primary in plant disease epidemiology. So in this workshop, uh, within the next two hours, I'm going to cover four major topics in plant disease epidemiology. So this is measurement using uh, the Plyman, the Plyman package to measure disease on images uh, as one way to, uh, to measure disease, to obtain disease values. The fitting of temporal progress models uh, to disease data over time using the EP feeder package. The fitting of gradient models using uh, a fit gradient function of the R4PD package. And the spatial pattern analysis using the R4PD package and also the AP5 package. So all of these packages are specialized for the analysis of plant disease epidemics. They are not general. Plima is a general package for image analysis, general purpose, but there is some functions that were uh, optimized to uh, estimate, to measure disease on images. That's what, what I want to show you later. I'm also gonna show you some shiny apps that we developed to help to, uh, to make more in interactive, so the Shine applications, so user can in interact with the system using R as the basis, but Shiny as the interface. So some ideas, some examples. I'm gonna show, gonna go back to these uh, Shiny apps later on each topic, and also some uh, spatial patterns. The simulation using Shiny apps to generate spatial data, 
and visualize some spatial data. And also, um, let's start with the, the need that we have to obtain the accurate disease measure, which is primary in plant disease epidemiology. If we want to construct a disease progress curve, we need this disease intensity measure here on the y-axis. Let me use the uh, laser pointer. Okay, now you can see better. This is intensity on the y-axis. We have another measure of intensity as the lesion count to express disease over distances from a known inoculum source or the relationship between the disease intensity and yield. So it's primary in epidemiology to obtain uh, plenty of data. So accurate data as accurate as possible to represent it, to describe and to model and to predict epidemics, we need disease data. There are several ways that we can obtain disease data. Some terms, important terms that we have prevalence and incidence. This is really simple, it's just a proportion. So we have a region, we have a different variable number of fields. Uh, if we have one out of six fields, we have 16% of prevalence. And incidence is actually at the field level, is the number or proportion of a disease in individuals over the total number of individuals in the field. That's the definition of incidence, which is easier to obtain. So you just need to count the number of positives compared to the total and compared to the total number of individuals in the, in, in the sample. But what's more difficult is called severity, which is a measure that we obtain usually uh, visually. We use our eyes to see the symptoms and to allocate or to classify, to um, attribute uh, scores, ordinal scores. The scores can be nominal, qualitative scores, quantitative scores, or the count of lesions, for example, or the ratio scale, which is a little bit more complicated to estimate visually. So if you look at this uh, figure on the right, you can see the diseased portion of the leaf and the healthy portion. We need, the, so that's the ratio. It's the proportion of uh, diseased tissue over the entire leaf area which is not so easy to obtain an accurate measurement because that will depend on the rate on the person evaluating, uh, assessing the disease. It varies from person to person and also uh, for the same person. On different days, we can not repeat, for example, the same value. And so the idea is that we can improve these visual assessments by using certain tools. One tool that we can use to improve our visual assessment is the standard error diagram, which is a series of uh, pictorial representations of our diagrams representing the percentage, a certain percentage value. So this can be made from uh, gray colors, uh, images or true color images, two color, three colors in different formats. But the idea here is that we have a guide. When we are assessing plant disease severity, we have something to guide us to reach the, the, the value is closest to the actual value. So how to obtain this actual value is also important. The most common way to obtain the actual disease or the real disease value is imaging through image analysis. So the idea is to segregate, segment the background. We can remove the background. We can calculate the total leaf area and calculate the total uh, diseased area here and, and we can get the ratio. We can use that using a commercial software like APS Assess, which is a paid software, it's expensive. Or we can use, we, can, we have an alternative in R, which is the deployment package. That's what I'm gonna show you. Now, I think we can, yeah. That's just before we go to our studio, just to explain how the package works. We need the uh, image palettes describing the background. So we have a uh, image, uh, PNG image for the background. We have a composite image describing the symptoms and uh, healthy area. So we combine, we need to construct these images 
before we go to our studio. So we need to call to import those palettes, images representing each section of the leaf, of, of the image actually. And what the, the, the software does is to calculate a logistic model to predict the classes, each of the classes. So the idea first is to remove the background and then compute the total error of the leaf and then later compute the disease error of the leaf. And then we have the, this ratio. Let's go to our studio now. Let me start sharing my screen. I have shared with you the uh, the packages before. You got the message from uh, Amal about the packages. Is everything okay? You are seeing my R Studio screen right now. Okay, looks like it's okay. I don't see anything on the chat. It's Should okay. Be okay. Let me... Yeah. Yeah. We we'll okay. see your R Studio. Let me just open the chat here at the screen. Okay, so the idea we just need to load the payment package first. Let me start here loading the, the package. I'm using the tidyverse here, so I'm gonna uh, load tidyverse. And the first uh, function is the import image import. So I created a folder where I have the originals, original uh, images. Here, the originals folder has this image 46. The image 46 is right here. I'm not sure if you can see my screen when I open it, but it's a uh, disease uh, swiping leaflet. Well, we don't the see the leaflet. image. Uh, should we see Okay, the now image? we can see. Now yeah. we can see the image, right? Yeah. Okay. We need to uh, to import the image we want to analyze first. That's the through the image import function. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate as how to analyze a single image or to analyze multiple images. There are different uh, options. So let's start with the simple one, which is to analyze this uh, the single image first. Let's go back to our studio. Okay. That's uh, assigned it to e image vector, okay, the image. And we can actually see the image through the image combine function from Clement package. Image combine, we can actually see the image, okay, on the R Studio. Within R Studio, we can see the image here. Um, so I have a question, is... sorry. I have okay. a question about these values. These values are like the average of the pixels or it's like, what does these values, like, is it like the image? The one here in the console. Okay. It's the, ob it's the image data object. Uh, I don't know if the, it's an image object. Actually, oh, okay. we don't, it's just the object saying that uh, that's the color mode, the storage mode, and the number of frames, and uh, some coordinates maybe oh, okay. for the image. Thank I'm you. not the developer of this package, so I don't really know what this means. So maybe it's a general type of image object from this oh, okay. that the function generates. But in order to see the image, we need the image combined. Image combine is the function to see the image. If the important image is okay, we can see in the in the, the below the chunk or in the plot um, tab here that I have open. Okay. So the second step is that we need to import the same use the same function you image import using uh, using the uh, the palettes. So yeah, I, I have here in the files, I have the palettes. That is SBR symptoms, S for symptoms, SBR H for healthy, SBR B for background. So I'm gonna assign to objects using image import for each of those uh, palettes, okay? 
because we are going to call these objects later to to say that's the B1 is the background, the H1 is the healthy object, and the healthy image, and the S is the symptomatic one. Okay, that's the most simple. Let me open the uh, so you can actually see the image. That's the. Here, the symptomatic one. It's a mosaic that we, I use the Google Slides to construct this image. Just picking some errors from a disease from several images. Okay, we construct this image, this composite image. And we do the same for the background because in the background we have some, we have the blue color in the black, in the background, but it's not the uniform color, we have different colors. So I pick the blue color from different uh, images to represent. So it's important to look at the border of the leaf because sometimes there is a background, there's a small shadow that we need to pick also. Okay, let's go back to our studio. So we are preparing, we can use image combine again so we can see the, the image. So we can see here the image combined the background. As you can see, I picked uh, several portions of the background and several healthy areas and several images from the diseased areas of the symptomatic area. There's another, another way to construct the image palettes. I'm gonna, not gonna, I'm gonna skip this now, but I'm gonna, actually go straight to the measured disease, which is the main function to analyze the severity. So the measured disease, we need the image object that we want to analyze, image. It's here, the image. Image IMG background is the argument for the background, which is B in our case. Image healthy, the H with the healthy and the symptoms, which is the S letter, okay? And this is, uh, the measured disease will give us, uh, you create an object with the severity for that image and some other information, but uh, but the most important is the severity. Let's see if that works. It's working. It's a little bit slow, I don't know why. Okay, okay. That's the output in the plot. As you can see in the plots uh, tab, we have the image and we have the outline of the lesions. You can see, can you see the outline here? Outlines, so what the package, what the function does is to, the, the, to do this contour uh, across all the lesions and we can calculate, it calculates the, uh, the severity here, leaf 63. So in the console, we can see 6.78, that's the severity. So that's a way to uh, obtain the measure disease, the severity measure for a single leaf single image using the appointment package, using image palettes, pre-prepared images. So the, another way to pick the, to select the areas for the background, the lesion and the leaf, uh, is to uh, use the peak palette, which is another function of the pack. So we can actually use this set the Plymouth viewer first, set the viewer as the map view. Let's set the map view. And let's pick the palette colors for the, from the image that will be the background and we are gonna assign to B1, okay? The B1 is gonna be our new one background image palette that we're gonna pick in interactively. Let me show you how we can do that. In the viewer, we should see, uh, a way to navigate through the image. 
Okay, P colors in the image. We can navigate. So you should be able to see by, I'm scrolling the image and going close. I'm gonna pick all from the background, okay? I'm gonna use this draw marker tool and I'm draw, I place the marker on several locations. So it's important to pick this uh, shadow, which is close to the leaf, but still belongs to the background here. So it's a dark blue or it's a darker color. And we pick whatever number of uh, place markers in this image that we think represents well the uh, background. Okay. And then we click on done. And the B1 now, it, that's the new image. Okay. That's a new image for the background. Let's change here now the background for the B1 and we can run it again. Let's see if the severity changes or keeps the same. So it looks like the background is okay. Let's see the severity. Sometimes it varies because it's a random 6.3. So it varies a little bit because of the random process of uh, the classification of the pixels of it, it of the image that's a classification problem so it, it depends on is you're not going to get the same value but it's close it's around the same value sorry okay. we have a question okay so uh yeah so this image must have the same dimensions quality and how to discard the image background also how define healthy and unhealthy area. Uh, it's important to not have a very high quality image because it takes time to process the image. Uh, I'm using images of, because uh, what's most important is that you have the color of the pixel. You don't need a high quality. The quality doesn't need to be high because it's, it's gonna take a lot of time to process this image. And uh, I'm using small images like uh, 2 KB, 250 KB should be okay. It uh, doesn't need to be large or small. You, you, the Plymouth can do the job in classifying pixels. And the background actually, uh, it should be standard. A standard color is okay, which is not the same color of the lesion. Uh, or the uh, the or the leaf color it should be a neutral uh, another color. I'm using blue black background as the standard, so that should be okay. And uh, because a complex background is more difficult because there will be a lot of uh, colors, so it's not advised to use complex background for using this when using this package. We need a standard and uniform background. Okay. And the definition of the healthy and unhealthy, when we have the palette we need to construct, we can do this manually, like we just did now, by picking the colors. Let's go ahead and pick the colors for the healthy again, using the pick palette, using the viewer. So now we are gonna create the object H, H1, which is, which is the healthy. So let's pick some randomly, some place markers here. And there, some here, here close to the vein, and here, and done. So that's our new palette for the, uh, for the leaf color. Let's go again, H1, and we run measure disease. It's working. Let me stop here and try again. should show up okay okay that's it 
Leaf 63 in the console, 4.57. So every time we change the palette, we change the process, even using the same palette every time we get a different value, but it's everything is around the actual value. It's very sensitive, it's a little bit sensitive to how you define the uh, your palette, color palettes. Let's see the for the symptoms, for example, the S1 pick palette for the symptoms. Now you want to select the symptoms, create a new image. Okay, that's the main symptom that we want to pick. Okay, here. And there is another one somewhere out here at the bottom. We also want the yellow as well. And click done. That's the new uh, image palette made in interactively. And now we can use this one as S1 and measure disease again. Okay, that's it. So we have something, so now it's 6.77. So it's everything around five to six. So it's sensitive to how you define your palette. Any question about this process? Because now we are gonna move on to how to analyze multiple images, which is more in, in resting as a batch processing process. Uh, any question? Yeah, no? please. Okay. Yeah, I, I have one. Okay. Uh, em em okay. Emerson, okay. I have a question. Uh, can we say that uh, the more points that we add to our palette, the more sensitive could be the measuring? Uh, the more accurate, maybe the more points you add to the palette is more representative of the symptom or the leaf or the background, I think. Because uh, what the package does is to randomly select the colors from the palettes randomly. So the more representative, representative the more the more points you have, perhaps is more accurate. More accurate. I would say. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So let's go to the measure. disease is the same function here now that we have. So we have a pattern. I have a directory, a folder that I call originals. So we have all the images in the originals folder. Okay. And I want to batch process those images in this folder. So I need to indicate where the folder is. View directory original. And I want to create a processed folder to store the processed images. The same image, save image equals true. We want to actually save the image in the processed uh, uh, folder. And again, we repeat the image healthy, image symptoms and image background. Some variables equal to false and plot equal to false. We can actually plot true here. So you can actually see what's going on. Let's see what happens here. Variables to true and plot to true. So we can actually see each image being processed real time. Let's see if that works. Processing image. You can see at the console, it's processing all the images. I picked just a small sample so it doesn't take long. It's gonna take long if you have larger images. So it's not uh, advisable to have large, high quality images that that's gonna take forever. Uh, we have one question. So uh, meanwhile, yeah, it's processing. Could we define different images as having different levels of severity instead of defining healthy infected and background area? Define the images as having different levels of severity instead of defining. The, actually, what the function does is to is not to define the levels, to define the ratio, the severity itself. 
the ratio. So because we need the healthy and infected areas to define this ratio. So I'm not sure if I understand the question actually, what do you mean by levels of severity? So you mean scores? So to classify, it's not, it's not the purpose here. The purpose is actually to as to get an estimation of the severity, the proportion of error of the leaf affected by the disease. That's the intention. It, that's what the function does. So we have now all leaves, and we can actually now see the uh, here in the console, the severity as in the symptom, symptomatic column here of the data frame. So we have the, all the, uh, the values of severity for each image. And we can actually uh, work with this data frame if you want to create a CSV file or export to different format. It's easy. And we can actually see in the processed, here the processed images, we can see each leaf image, how it was classified, segmented actually. Here, as you can see, that's one example of the one leaf using the palette. It's not perfect, but it's close to the, it's better than estimating this visually. I think it's better than a visual assessment. If we annotate this image using like painting the lesions and painting the whole leaf, it should be be close, much better than a, a human being estimating the severity of vision. Okay. Let's go back to our studio. Uh, there is another another option which is to split the image. Uh, sometimes we have a bunch of images. We don't want to scan or take a picture of one for one leaf per image. We have multiple images like this one. Let me show you in the originals. We have this soybean three leaves. I'll share here so we can actually see this one. Can you see now uh, three leaves, three actual leaflets side by side? Okay, we are gonna use uh, another function which is called measure disease by L, by leaf. By leaf, let's import this image first. You use the image import here the new image, we can use image combine to actually see this image, image number two, here, image number two, which is the three leaflet image, and uh, let's create the object three leaves using measure disease by BYL, and we're gonna indicate the number uh, the name of the image. The index um, for the background now, it's the same as we had before. We're gonna use the same. Image healthy, image symptoms, save image as true, and process it is proc two now, because we have another, we're gonna export to another folder, different folder, okay? The three leaves now is being processed. So the proc number two, now we have, you can see image number one, two, and three. So it was split into three images. And we have the severity now in the console for each. Uh... Let me stop here. Let me start all over. Okay. It's taking some time to process the images. Okay, should be okay now. Okay, that's what we get. For image number one, two, and three, the percent of disease, 
40%, 43%, and 6.8%, as you can see in the console. Okay. Uh, to end this section, I just wanted to show you um, a last function, which is the measure disease iter, as the author of the pact created, iter. It's actually interactive, the idea and then we are going to uh, select in an image by image basis we can select first the background then later the belief colors and the disease colors so the first one the first uh, click is going to be for the background oops our session aborted start new session mm, that was not working it was working yesterday when i tested Just wait a little bit for the, our studio to come back. Okay, let me import again the image. Let me import again. Okay, image is here. Now it's scrolling down here. Measure disease interactively. If it then if right to the crashes again, we're gonna skip this. So sorry. Uh, image not found. Mm, maybe the session to the source file location. Okay. No, it's okay. Interactive. So the last step here we want to try. So we should see something the viewer tab. Okay, you're gonna pick calls for the background. Calls for the background. Colors and then we click done. Now the next colors for the uh, for the leaf colors. Colors done, and then finally the colors for the uh, the lesions portions of the image. I'm doing this quickly and not uh, quite accurate, just to show you how this works, so we can try this later. And then we have the result here. So it's not that bad. It's not that bad. There are some portions here that it's not the disease, but it's fine. And uh, I did not assign to an object, so I don't see in the console the severity, so I should have assigned to an object. Okay, and that's it. That's the what I wanted to show you about using climate package to analyze disease uh, severity to obtain the actual value. So we can construct the standard error diagrams. We can that's actually a standard error diagram function in the climate package that you can construct standard error diagram. Once you have like hundred leaves and we analyze hundred leaves, we can that is a SAD function. You can construct actually uh, the, the standard error diagram with the, the desired number of uh, diagrams that we want. So yeah, these uh, we have like two questions, and these okay. led us to our first question: If there is a large set of data set leaf plant, what will be the command to read the image file? Large set of data set leaf plants that would be the command. That's the actually the uh, I, as I showed you in the code, that is the the way to call the directory. We store the files in the folder and we instruct that uh, e each image actually should have a common starting name. I've used 
IMG, so as an acronym for image. So all the images should have the same name. And then you store those images in a folder and you call the image, import those images from that folder. That's the way to, that's the, the function, what the function does. So the measure disease function is actually the one that does this. We just need to indicate in the argument uh, where the folder is to the, the original images are stored and then it batch processes all the images. That's no specific command. It's just the same measured disease function. Okay. Okay. I see another question. The processed image only necrotic spots are delimited. Is there any mean to have more accurate image that the limit is also the colorotic errors? Yes. It all depends on how you select, you pick the colors for the, your, your palette. If you include the colorotic area in the, Diseased portion that will take be taken into account. So it all depends on do you construct your disease palette or symptomatic. It doesn't matter if it's only necrotic or the chlor chlorotic. It's gonna consider what you have in the palette. Okay. Those were the questions I could see in the chat. Is there anything else regarding this section so we can move on to the next section? Yeah, so please go ahead and uh, put the question in the chat or unmute yourself and ask the question, please. Okay, I don't see more questions. I'm gonna move on to the next section here. So for the temporal disease progress, the basic idea is that we have uh, assessment times. We want to construct this plot, which means the disease is increasing over time. And we want to fit some models to obtain uh, parameters for these models. So we can compare epidemics according to these parameters or the area under the disease progress curve, we can obtain, calculate this area under the curve, or we can actually fit a best model to the data progress, disease progress data. And we, there's a, several ways we can do that in R using the base R functions. But the idea here is to show the epifeeder package to automate this process, to facilitate this, this process. Okay, let me show you how we can do that. Uh, just before we move on to the epifeeder, I would like to show you this, uh, this shiny app where uh, that was constructed in our shiny to demonstrate how to, how the very, how the shapes of the models can vary according to the, the parameters that you set. So we have the initial inoculum, we can have different inoculum, initial infection rate, it can vary, and we can actually choose the model. So that's the exponential model, the most simple model that we can use to describe a uh, polycyclic epidemic here. So in the, in the left plot, we can see actually the, how we can vary the disease intensity at the time zero, we have the different height of this curve here, okay? But we can actually uh, select another model like the monomolecular model, the, that's uh, the shape change. And you can see in the plot, lead plot here, the values for each uh, point over time. And we can set the maximum disease actually as well. We can set this maximum disease and uh, the du duration time of this epidemic like 100 days, that would be something like that, 100 days. And the logistic model, and we can vary the rates here, and we have to get different shapes. This is the K maximum disease. So that's the idea, so education to show how we can get different shapes of the models according to the parameters that we, we, can, uh, we can modify. So let's go back to the... 
Uh, actually, we have a question in the chat. What did you mean by okay. fit some models? Okay, let me go back here. So the idea is that we can uh, see what is the best model. So for example, in this screen, you see four different models. What is the best fitting model for the data that I have? So clearly I have two models in this screen that fits best the, the data, that is the best fitted to the data I have. So I'm gonna fit the models to the data. So I have the Gompertz model, which is the line crossing very close to the points. So that's the best model. So the closest to the points, the best is the model. And we can actually have some criteria, statistical criteria to select the best model, to pick the best model. So we can only, just by looking, just visually less like we are doing now, we can guess that we can easily eliminate the exponential model. So the exponential model is not a good one based on this fit because we, there is a sigmoid curve. So the sigmoid curve is, resembles more the uh, Gompertz and the logistic model. And actually we can see how best the Gompertz, if uh, we can compare actually the Gompertz and the logistic model for each curve. So that's how we, we select the best model to our data. And the epifitter package um, outputs the statistics of the fitting and also this plot uh, so we can judge visually the best model. Let's go back to our studio. And the package that we are gonna use is called uh, Epifeeder, library Epifeeder. My student, uh, Kaique Alves, developed this uh, package when he was a PhD student in my lab. So I challenged, challenged him to develop something that would be useful for my classes <laughs> instead of uh, doing every, everything manually in R so we could automate this process. And he was super smart developing this uh, Epifeeder package. So let's work with, uh, in the book, you can actually pick this uh, Pepper data set. There are three different uh, disease progress curves here. In the book, in the temporal analysis, in the address, you can actually copy and paste these uh, curves, which means um, that's actually transformed from the uh, wide format to the long format, so we can plot and visualize the three curves at the same time using Pavilonger. And that's another code that you can just pick from the book to construct this. Uh, actually, better to. Oh, there's a lost pipe here. Okay. Now we see on the plots tab the three different curves. So the idea here is to choose one model, a common model for the three epidemics, for the three curves. So what is the best way to do this? We can do this individually for each curve, for each epidemics, or we can run another function in the pack that does this for the three epidemics at the same time. So for the single epidemics, we have the this function called fit lean. Let's uh, create the object called ap ap two, and the fit lean need requires time, argument time, and the y, which is the the y value. So the time and the x axis, and the y is the y axis for epidemic uh, number two. So we can use fit lean. It uh, is going to fit a linear model. So that's two ways to fit models to disease data. So the first one is the linear model and directly the nonlinear model using in the background the NLS function of the R base package. So there are two ways that we can do that. So the fit lean, so it is going to return, going to give us this one, EP2. Let me show you the output. 
So the stats, the for this curve, the pack to, like the function does is to rank the models according to the concordance coefficient, the CCC, the coefficient. So the closest to one, the better. The closest one, the better, this coefficient. So the, the logistic model is a better fit for the curve number two, the logistic model. So it's ranked according to the CCC. And we have the parameters that we are interested. The logistic one for the logistic, the estimate of the infection rate, which these parameters, they have a biological significance. So it's how fast epidemics evolves. And the logistic model, we have the initial knocking. So using these values, we can actually construct the curve. We can actually fit the curve using those values, okay? But we don't need to worry about the coding for that because Epifeeder offers this plot fit function, the plot fit, Epi, Two, then we can compare all the models, okay? We can actually compare visually. So the best model was the logistic one. If we look at the, how uh, the line agrees with the points, you, we can actually see that the logistic one is the better fit for this model compared to the Gompertz, for example, which would be another sigmoid shape function that we could use, but actually the logistic one is the better fit, visually speaking. And also statistically speaking is the best one, okay? We can calculate the area under the curve, which is another uh, way to obtain a measure of the epidemic over time. The AUDPC, AUDPC function is the one that we can use. And we can set proportion to true because actually we have the proportions in our original data set, it's proportion. All the data is scaled from uh, zero to one, okay? And the error under the curve, we can just run and we obtain here in the console, 25.34. That's the area under the curve. There's another package that, does, uh, that you can obtain this AUDPC, which is called Agricoli. It's another package, but the function was included in the epifeeder. So we have the function in the in the same package that you use to fit the models. You have the AUDPC function. So now uh, let's go straight to the uh, way to fit uh, the models for multiple epidemic data sets. So actually we have in our data set three epidemics. That's called this pepper two. It's the same, so the same code we have a, a now in the long format, the paper two. Everything is in the long format now. And we actually have now a treatment, uh, a treatment uh, strata column that we did not have before because when we transform to the long format, we have the treatment uh, as a code for the epidemic, the epidemic number. And now the function is called fit multi. The fit, the fit multi for multiple uh, epidemics. We, the time call is called the T, as we can see here, the time call. The intensity, this is intensity column is the IMC, like an in incidence. And the date is paper two in the long format. And the strata calls is treat. So the code a variable for the each epidemic is called the treat, different treatments. And aniline is set to false. So we can actually use the nonlinear or the linear approach to uh, fit models to the data. Let's keep it false for now. And then we have the uh, output of this function. It's a little bit more complex than the fit lean, but we have now for each epidemic, like here, we have the best, the best model. So epidemic number one, number one, we have the Gompertz as the best model. The Gompertz as the best model. Here's the rate. Here's the standard error of the rate. And, um, in an interval, 
in the wall values, confidence in the wall values. And also we have for the epidemic number two, the best one was the logistic one. So it's not the complex was not the best one. And for in the epidemic number three, the logistic one. So we need to make a decision on two models. Which one is the best model that we're gonna fit to the whole three, the whole set of epidemics. So the logistic is the champion. So we are gonna pick one. So because we, if you want to compare the rates or the initial outcome, we need the same model, okay? That's what I had for this. Let me uh, show you this uh, fit nonlinear, which is uh, uh, an alternative to the fit lean. It's the fit and lean, AP22. Let's call this AP22. There are some warnings because of the nonlinear fit, but actually we have the same output now. We have the same output as we had before for feeding the models. And we actually can use plot fit, plot fit of AP22. And we have the same plot as we had before and actually showing the logistic one, the logistic model as the better fit. Actually the Gompert is also a good fit, but the logistic one is better because the lines are closest to the points, okay? As you can see here, the lines are passing very close to each dot, each point, each point here. So that's how we can uh, actually uh, fit disease progress models, the four models and pick the best model uh, suggested by the AP feeder package. Uh, there is a question. Uh, can we use another model like Richard's? If yes, how do you introduce the, mm. the question? Uh, the Richard's, it's a flexible because there is a third parameter. It's not included as yet in the epifeeder package. So we can't fit the Richard's because we would need to add a third parameter. Actually, we can set the K, the maximum value of the disease. I did not show you, but you can actually add the K as the maximum value. But the Richards for now, we don't have the possibility to run, to fit the Richards. We need to modify the package to do that. Uh, actually, I have a question about overfitting. So does the logistic regression model overfit the data or how do you know that you don't have overfitting of the data? The overfitting is not a big issue in this case because we want to select the one single model for all the epidemics. So the best one is gonna be the, the best fitting model. So the, the best, uh, the closest to the points the model passes, the better. So it's a non-flexible model anyway. So I'm not too concerned about overfitting because it's not a, a flexible model that takes different shape. For example, if you have a, a, a model with too many parameters, that's going to fit perfectly the data. So actually the logistic one, I don't think that's an issue with overfitting. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions before we move to the other uh, section about the gradients, disease gradients, which is similar to the temporal models. The idea here is to fit the best gradient model to the gradient data. And uh, I'm gonna share my screen so you can see some uh, concepts about this um, here. I'm sharing now. Okay, uh, this is great. Two questions actually before moving on. So do we have okay. a GitHub for the codes? 
And then the other question is, is it possible to define the health infected areas using panchromatic or black and white image beside the color image? Mm, okay, the last question is yes, we can use black and color. As, as long as we have different uh, colors for the background, like for example, gray, you have a gray background, you have a white color for the leaf, and you have a black color for the lesion, it's possible. You just need to select the colors that you want for each class. Okay. And the first question is about the GitHub. You mean everything is on the book? Everything I'm showing here is on the book, is in the book. And there is the GitHub. The, the book is actually, you can copy and paste and run, but then there is actually the GitHub code for the book that you can just navigate through and pick whatever you want from there. Anything I missed? No, I'm sharing the link to the book and the link to the GitHub of the book. So, okay, yeah. that should be should be fine. Okay, let's go back to here to disease gradients. I also have a shiny app to show, but the idea is that we have uh, differently from something that increases over time. Now we have something, the disease, that's going to decrease over distances from the inoculum source. So we have a zero point here, like the source of inoculum. And because the pathogen is going to spread from that source to other plants, we are going to see that the closest to the source of inoculum, we have more disease. Then as the distance increases, we are going to see less disease. So that's what we call this the gradient curve, which is different from the progress curve, which is progress increases over time. Now I have a disease that's going to decrease over distances from a non inoculum source. And there is also this uh, shiny app uh, developed uh, in our studio in Shiny. And actually, I should mention that I, I developed these uh, shiny apps with the assistance of the chat GPT-4, which is a great tool if you want to develop apps, something that you don't really have the time to learn all the shiny stuff. So we can have a talk with the chat GPT and co-pilots and some other AI tools. It's very, it's not so complicated to develop the apps. You need to have a minimal knowledge on uh, Shiny apps so you can adapt the code that generates for you. You can have some conversation and you can get this app. So I just had the code in R. I just talked with the chat GPT to how um, help me how to construct these Shiny apps. So the idea I have, we can also set the parameters here interactively and we can see how the, the shape of the gradient is gonna change according to the, par the parameters. They have two different models. So the in the AP feeder, we have four choices, four models. Now I restricted to only two models, the exponential model and the modified power model. Exponential and modified power. So that's, uh, that, let me show you the subtle difference between those, uh, those models. The exponential model actually has a more a less steep gradient, a less steep gradient compared to the uh, modified power. The modified power according to the parameter that we have, it's gonna have a, a more steep Okay, you need higher values. <laughs> okay, you need higher values. The parameter B is higher values. So that's the difference between the modified and the exponential model. So that it also depends on the parameter C, which is the, the distance from the inoculum source. So I'm gonna stop here showing these uh, shiny apps and we're gonna go back to our studio.
and then we can see how to the basic idea here in using there is a function in R for for PDE, which is uh, called fit gradients. Let me go back to this R Studio. This is gradients. Also from the book, we can have these uh, uh, the two vectors. Let's create two vectors, one vector for the distance values, and also a vector for the y values, for the disease values, and create a data frame. And we can actually visualize this gradient here. Let's visualize the gradient. That's the plot for the gradient. So what we want to do now is to select the best model that fits the gradient data. So the same objective that we had before with the temporal models, we have the, this objective here. We can do this manually if fitting the, an exponential model in R using the LM, the linear model function of the base R. Actually, we can do that and we can get the parameters. But we need to do that for each model separately. Separately. So the modified power, you have the fund modified power, but, uh, and we can also need to judge and construct more plots and do more work manually. The idea of the fit gradients function is that we can actually fit the, the two models at the same time and get the statistics of the model fitting that is going to help you to make a decision on what the model fits best the data. The fit gradients and fit number one is here. So we have this object which has the list with the data, the data frame, and also the results table with the intercepts the intercept and the, the the parameters for the for each model, and the R square, which is a statistics that help us to judge what's the best model in this case. Let me pick here just the results table. That's the results table, and we can see that actually the modified power is a better fit to the data because of the higher R square. You see on the console here, 0 0.97. And actually that is, is a, we can use a, a better, uh, we can use, we can actually plot. There is a plot output for the fit um, one, which is uh, plot power for the power model and for the original data. We can actually see that the, the model is, provides a very good fit to this gradient data. Let's use the patchwork here to get the plot side by side. So that's the power, the transformed, uh, the transformed uh, variable in the original with the fit. So that's what the uh, that's what the function does is to help us to make a decision on what's the best model based on the results, the statistical results. The R square is the main one here. So the modified power is the best one. And uh, we actually can guess the size of the inoculum according to the argument called C, the C argument here, 0 0.4. So 0 0.4 is the approximately the the size of the of the uh, the source. I can change that actually to zero point one if if I want, and then still the modified power is the the power or the modified power are good options here too, as well. Let me see if that works. Modified power. Oops. That's the modified power. So both models, the power models are best uh, 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 choices to this uh, kind of gradient data, okay?
we have uh, two questions. Okay, let's let's see. Yeah. So, uh, thanks for doing this. You didn't mention how to account for temporal autocorrelation in temporal disease progress, which is very important in time series data. How do we account for that? No, the package does not account for that. In the does not account for temporal for autocorrelation. That's not taken into account in a feeder. There are some other ways that you can account for that using other functions, uh, like generalized linear models. You can have a mixed models for that, but actually a feeder is just a linear. Actually using the linear and the non-linear, but does, we do not account for autocorrelation. Yes, yeah, so this lead me to the other question. Why did you choose linear models? The data is not normally distributed. Actually, we transformed the data to get it normally distributed. That's why we call linear models. We use the linear models because we work with the transformation. If we take have something that is exponential, for example, yeah, or uh, a logistic one, we have a transformation specific for that one to normalize. That's why we can work with the linear models and it's very easy to uh, back transform the, the parameters from the transformed model to back transform to the original scale. And then we can work with that. So that's how we, for convenience, it's, it's nice to use the linear models to demonstrate the, the, the calculations. And then the last question for now is, is there any way to have a two dimensions model spatial temporal expressing temporal dynamic and gradient and to represent it with a curve in R? Yeah, it's possible. It's possible as long as you have the, uh, the time and the distance, you have two axes and you have a third axis. So you can actually do that, but it's not what I showed you here. Just, just showed you a gradient in a single time, not at multiple times, but it's possible, yes, to do this in, in a... Actually, you, have a, you need a surface plot. You have the distance, the time, and the disease level. Uh, there is another question. What does your model tell us that you just fitted for gradient? It's the same as the graph. What does your model tell us that you just fitted to, for gradient? So it's just the same as the graph. Actually, I don't think I understand the question well. So the model, we judged the, we compare the different models when we fit different graded models to the data. So we want to compare what is the best model. So based on the R square, we judge that uh, one model is better than the other model. That's what we, we want. And we want actually to show the gradient and to show the model. Uh, ideally, the best model, the line is gonna pass close to the points. So actually, it's a it's a fixed uh, parameter model. So it's always the same shape. The exponential or the modified power is going to be the same. So it does not is not a flexible model. No, actually, there's another question. Should we always go to data transformation for obtaining a good model? Actually, the answer is no. You can use like the AP feeder, the nonlinear modeling uses the, the NLS function of the R base as a basis for running for fitting that model. So it's not only not always, it's a matter of choice. Some people prefer to transform the data, some people prefer to use nonlinear, it's a matter of preference. So both it's you're not gonna get the same results, the same parameters if you go with the transformation or directly with the nonlinear model, but uh, the parameters should be close by, so it sh should be okay.
Another question? We still have uh, half an hour until we are done with our time. No, there is uh, no I have more. A last section. I have a last, uh, last section about the spatial analysis, which is a very simple one as the most of the examples I'm showing here. So in the book, you have much more examples. I just picked the uh, four uh, sections to for talks, major talks. So I can demonstrate the, how these, uh, which are the most common analysis that we perform in epidemiology, which is measuring disease, feeding temporal models, feeding gradient models, and now analyzing spatial patterns of plant disease epidemics. Let me uh, start sharing here. Go back to sharing. So the spatial patterns, you have actually three major main patterns that we that it, everybody knows about this. It's about the regular pattern, a random, which is more realistic, that we have a disease in the field that follows the random pattern. It's more difficult, or we can actually simulate a regular, regular pattern in plant disease. If we inoculate plants, at certain distances, we can have a regular pattern, but the random and the aggregated pattern is more realistic for plant disease epidemics. And actually we have patterns of disease over time. So every time we look at a single plot like this in the, the first row, we have a snapshot what, what's going what's going on in the field at uh, different times. It's a snapshot for single time. But actually, you have something that evolves and changes the patterns over time. And the question is, what is the spatial pattern? When there are several different questions that we can make questions about spatial patterns, but the one single is going to be, what is the pattern? Is it random or is it aggregated? And then we have the data, and we want to analyze the data and make a decision on what's the best, what's the pattern. So that it will be a statistical test, uh, no hypothesis about the expected uh, uh, pattern being, for example, random, and we reject the hypothesis of randomness, and we accept the alternative, which is non-random. And uh, the examples I'm going to show you, we have a row of diseased plants. 32 plants in this example here. And then we have uh, the status of each plant is gonna be zero or one, zero as healthy and diseased as one. And we have a series and we want to uh, test for the randomness, randomness of this uh, series here. So that's something that we can do. And also we can have a binary matrix and we can also look at uh, pairs of healthy and diseased plants vertically or horizontally, taking into account the position in a matrix. That is another function that we can uh, actually uh, use for, for, for that. I'm gonna show you three examples. And the th last one is this group data. We have a count of pathogen propagates in the soil, for example. We have areas and we have a more higher concentration of disease in some areas, but actually we want to define this pattern. Is it random or is it aggregated? In all three examples, I'm going to show you the question is, what is the pattern? Is it random? That is a hypothesis that it's random and we can reject, based on the data, we can reject the hypothesis of randomness and accept the alternative, which is known randomness. Okay, let's go now to the art studio. And the spatial analysis. Uh, the first and the very simple and old method to analyze series of data or the binary sequence, it's uh, ordinary runs, which is a test. That is, there is a function, O runs, O runs, underline underscore test in the library R4PD. So let's <laughs> create this uh, binary sequence of data. 
and we call this uh, vector as y vector. We load the, the package and we run the test. Okay, in the console, we can see the results. The total number of runs. So what is the run? So it's important to, to know the definition of run. Run is a sequence of individuals with the same status. So the number of runs in this case, we can count as one, here, one, two, like series of zeros, two, three, four, five, six, and, uh, and eight. And we have eight, uh, actually eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight. Actually, there is a number, total number of runs is counted as eight. Hmm. Let me see, let's go back here. It should be okay. So I I'm, I'm got confused about this. Let me go back here. <clears throat> no, actually I want to go back to my studio. Sorry. Should be okay, the number of runs. And we have the, the standard deviation of the runs. We have the z-score, you have the p-value. So in this case, we have a series of data that follows an aggregated pattern. Based on the z-score, which is greater than 2.3 minus 3.2, we uh, have the z-score, the sequence exhibits aggregation or clustering. That's the main result of the function. So it automates the process of counting the, the runs and and uh, calculates the z-score and the p-value associated with the, the hypothesis. So the p-value 0 0.0007, so we reject the hypothesis of the new hypothesis of randomness, and we take the alternative one, which is non-randomness, which means aggregation. That's what the package does. Um, the joint count is statistics is a little bit different because we work on a, with a matrix, we have the matrix here. It's also in the book. You can copy and paste this, uh, the data. You can create the matrix using the matrix uh, function of R, the base R. And actually we define the number of rows and columns, five by five. And we define that it's by row equals true because we want to all the sequences by row. So that's the first row, the second row, and so on. So we create the matrix, and then we can actually visualize the matrix here. So one, zero, one, one, zero is row one, row two, one, one, zero, 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 okay? And actually we now have the chart count function of this uh, R4PD package that does this test that uh, I'm gonna test the hypothesis that uh, the pattern is random and we can reject this hypothesis. Actually it tests for the occurrences of the DD, the pair of diseased plants and the pairs of healthy plants, horizontally and vertically. And ideally for this kind of uh, pattern that we have, the data that we have, it's likely to be random because you can you can see that uh, there's no cluster actually of diseased plants in this uh, in this data set. And we have the output in the console for the HD sequences for the individuals of different status. The pattern for HD is not aggregated, so it's random. And the pattern for the DD sequences is not aggregated. So they agree with each other. So it takes into account the position of the DDs and HDs in the, by row and by column. And that's what the, uh, the package does. One way that we could do instead of using the joint count would be to run, to get the entire series and run an ordinary runs test. But it's not. Uh, it's a different way to analyze the special pattern using the joint count because we take into account the vicinity, uh, the the neighbors, 
uh, in a row and in the column of different status or the same status plants. Okay, that's what the joint count test does. <clears throat> Any question so far? So for this case, I have binary data. It's a incidence map. I have mapped each plant with a different status, diseased or non-diseased, that's why we call it incidence. And we have a map. And then having this map, we can use the joint count using the binary data, yes or no, we can get uh, uh, the spatial pattern, whether it's, uh, make a decision whether it's aggregated or random. So we have questions. Uh, are binary scores still available to measure aggregation when we use severity and not incidence, presence or absence? Yeah, actually, if you have uh, if you have severity, you can classify severity uh, binarized to use this kind of test. So this kind of test that I showed you, they require binary data. For severity and not incidence, we have other tests that's in the book, as you can see in the book, like uh, spatial auto correlation. You can use geostatistics, uh, semi semi-virograms, or also the, the other test that I'm, that I'm gonna show you, which is the SADI analysis of uh, epidemics using group data. Okay, and we have another question about the matrix. What large the matrix could be? I didn't test the maximum size of the matrix, but actually it can deal with the large matrix matrices. I don't, I have never tested. I work actually with the small data, data sets, but you can test if you have a large matrix of binary data, you can test if that works. It should take longer, but uh, it should be feasible. Okay. okay, let's see the, uh, the last uh, is called SADI. It's also in the book, in the spatial pattern, the group data. I'm gonna... Uh, we have I'm gonna, another question uh, actually. Okay. What's the practical implication of this? If you perform experiment in the field, will you know if uh, patterns are random or not? Okay. The practical implication is that usually you are running a survey, not experiments. Actually, you don't, when you have an experiment, you have the average of the plot or of your field plot. You have the average. You don't need to worry about the spatial patterns. The idea here is that you want to answer different questions about why, where is the inoculum coming from, for example? Is it coming from the inside the field or externally? from other sources. So depending on the your prior knowledge of the system, if by defining the spatial pattern, you can actually answer different questions about where is the knocking coming from, which is one example. So you have, a, uh, for example, some diseases that you start with the knocking coming from the seeds. And initially, actually I'm, I'm showing you just a snapshot, so just one time, but actually spatial patterns involve also the analysis of the epidemics over time. So we have temporal and spatial component here, uh, but actually it's not advised to use it in experiments because as you, as the Asan Khan mentioned, you're gonna know if you, you have the pattern. So ideally it's not, it's not the question you want to answer in an experiment. Mainly for surveys, it's more common. Let me go ahead and then we have more time at the end to answer all questions regarding the spatial patterns. Okay, let's go ahead and move to the uh, use of SADI function of the AP5 package. The package is called AP5. Okay, AP, that's called these. Uh, I also pulled these from the book. It's a data set. 
uh, with the group data. Let's visualize this group data here. Let's transform to the uh, actually to the longer format because the AP one is in the wide format, as you can see here in the console. We have a kind of matrix, but it's not a matrix. It's a data frame organized in the long in the wide format, and we want to transform this to the long format. AP two. Now it's in the long format, X, Y, and N. And actually we want to create this, uh, the Y here as num numeric. And we transform, we have now the AP2, and we can actually use a ggplot to plot. So that's the plot that we got. And the same example in the slides that I showed you. That's the structure of the data. I have a X and Y position, and I have a group data, the count of individuals on each, on each point in this space. You have counts. And the question is, is this pattern aggregated or random? That's the question we want to answer using the AP5 package. I'm not going to explain a lot about the details of the SADI, but the, the idea is that the SADI calculates the distance to regularity. So the points ideally would move, they would make movements from a patchy area to the gap area. And that according to the distance, the total distance that the points would need to move, it calculates the random distance uh, to regularity and the actual distance that the points would need to move. And we have uh, an index for for that to calculate this index of aggregation. So it's going to be more aggregated. The index is going to be inflated or larger than one if the distance is too large. So the points we need to move greater distance to achieve a regular pattern. That's the, basically what the SADI does. But actually it's interesting because you have a test and it's going to give us a p-value for that test and we can uh, make a decision based on the p-value. So the SADI, I need the AP5 package, of course. Okay, first, and SADI is computing a computation of the Paris indices, and it's done. And here, that's what we need to look at. The IA, which is the aggregation index, is much greater than one, so it's 2.51, which is greater than one. And also have the p-value less than 0 0.05. So it's actually, we reject the null hypothesis of randomness and we accept the alternative, which is no randomness or aggregation. That's what the, the, the package does. And there's a summary with more statistics here. And what's interesting is this uh, SADI shows a plot with the gaps and the patch areas. So we can see where we have more inflows and outflows of, from this data set. So the inflows are gonna be areas of the gap that received the, the flows of uh, individuals and outflows more populated or dense areas that received uh, that where the individuals moved from and it's actually is an index here, as you can see. So we have a patchy area we indicated by the red color, the red areas and the, and the gap areas in the blue. And the index is standardized between less than 1.5 and uh, greater than 1.5 here, the index. So it's another way to visually appraise the the SADI, how the SADI works in the background. So patch and gap. And it's clear that we have aggregation in this in this data set based on these patches and the areas of the patches and gaps. This was developed by a colleague from France, the AP5 package. There are other functions, and in the book I showed you, I showed some other functions. Uh, I just uh, picked a few examples. 
given the time, the short time we, we have here. Let me see. I think we have time for... Uh, We have some questions here. If we do a, a server, we don't have grids and cells. Later, it will be a flat surface. So how is it possible to enter the data from server into R? Actually, you need a way to map the individuals in the space. You can use, uh, you need an X and Y value for the location of these, uh, of the individual. You can use a GPS, for example. You have a GPS, you can map the individuals, but there are some methods that you don't actually need the position of the individuals. You can have a distribution. You, we work with distribution of the data. And depending on the, on the distribution of the data, we can uh, make a decision on the spatial pattern. So actually we have two different kinds of data. What I showed you, is that the situation when we have knowledge about the position of each plant or group of plant, group of, groups of plants, but actually we can, we, in some cases we don't have knowledge. We don't know the location of the individuals and we can use uh, another set of uh, tests that I have in the book when you don't know the location of these, uh, these plants. It's about the previous section. It's uh, which uh, uh, nonlinear model that you could uh, recommend? What nonlinear model? Yeah. It's actually the same models because they are nonlinear models. The logistic model is a nonlinear model. All of the models that I showed you, they are nonlinear models. We linearize the variable to use the linear models. That's what we do. But actually the exponential, the modified power, they are actually nonlinear models. They're all nonlinear models. And we can use, go with nonlinear modeling directly, or we can transform and go with the linear modeling. That's what we do. There is a question uh, if the index, I think the SADE index correlates with the local Morans, I, in some extent, yes, it's, uh, it tends to correlate, actually, it's a different, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if the, there's a correlation between the indexes, but it tends to show the same thing at the end. So with using different philosophy, they tend to show the same thing. So there's, yes, a correlate, kind of correlation between the, the local Morans, I. Uh, another question, is there any way to have continuous lines to represent the disease distribution in the plot? What do you mean, have a line like a contour, contour line? Yes, it's possible to use the contours. Actually, there is a function in Epify. Uh, in Epify, there is a function that you can also actually add the lines, the contour lines at the uh, index contouring contouring the indexes yes also so how do we co uh, compare epidemics using uh, the models what parameters do we use the two two parameters which are the most important they have biological significance which is the the y at time zero which is mean the initial inoculum uh, I think you are referring to temporal models because we are comparing epidemics, right? Using the models. So the parameters would be the uh, the initial inoculum and the rate. If we want to compare through three epidemics, we can compare by the rate of this function or these models. So if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the chat. We still have some time for questions.
I think we have a question from Mustafa later. I have a very basic question that might not be related with data analysis, but I just want to ask how difficult it is to use R software for data analysis for students who never use it before. Oh, that's a very general question. That's the purpose of these uh, yes. workshops, right? <laughs> Is to make it less difficult for the users to become familiar with the language, with the syntax, and to run, to do basic things. So I think that uh, the idea of having specialized packages is to uh, help to decrease this, uh, the learning curve so we can have specialized functions like some of the functions that I showed you in this morning about how to fit the models, how to select the best models. So it tends to make it simpler for the user to use this, uh, these tools. So the idea is that we need to have more books, more articles, more workshops, and to spread this, uh, the word about so many things that you can do in R that you can easily replace some uh, other tools that are maybe easier for the user because it's a point and click software, but actually you can have something more powerful and you can have better control if you want to do your analysis, do the plotting, and also you can write reports in R, like uh, I'm using the uh, Markdown language to produce, uh, like I'm using the the book, uh, the book, not the book down, is the quarto book system to produce a book in R. So there are so many advantages if you want to go deep into the learning R. There are so many ad advantages compared to other ways. So it's not, they're not the right and the wrong way to do things, but that's the way that you can become more productive. And in my case, I became more productive using R, I think. Thank you. So we have another question Rega regarding uh, special patterns. The, there will be thousands of plants, even if you, uh, if you know the position. How do we enter this data into R to know if patterns are random or not? The, uh, there will not be just X and I. In thousands of plants, if you know the position of the internet. Actually, we enter as a data frame. If we know the position, that's going to be the position, the latitude and longitude, and the status or the number of uh, diseased plants as a grouped plant. So I that would be X, Y, and Z, for example. You have the X, Y, and Z. Like in the example I just showed you using Sadie analysis, we have the X, the Y, and the Z, which was the count of plants, diseased plants on each location. Uh, so thank you very much about this amazing session. It was really, I think, very informative and many of our participants are really grateful. Uh, just to say that for our next workshop, we will have a session about building reproducible analytical pipelines with R. So yeah, using targets. So please attend our next workshop. We will send you all the information about it. And thank you again so much, yeah, Professor Emerson, for this amazing workshop. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have thank a you wonderful much. day. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Amal. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Emerson.